Okay, so hello everyone and welcome to the Global Forecasting School's um, weekly seminars. So today it's our pleasure to have Jose with us. Uh, we have been working with Jose for a few years already and we uh, we have uh, done a lot of incredible work together, including the Transparency um, Index, the paper that we published the last year and much more. So today he is going to present uh, one of uh, his latest research that he has done with his colleagues at the Banco da Republica, uh, the Central Bank of Colombia. And the topic of today's discussion is assessing the macroeconomic impact of weather shocks in um, Colombia. So without further ado, I will uh, give the floor to Jose. Thank you, Asia. For the kind introduction and thank you doc for for having me here in the uh, weekly uh, global forecasting school seminar um, as you may know uh, the idea of this seminar is to present like new research this work that i'm going to present today is preliminary is something that we are working on we have already tried to develop some models to incorporate weather shocks one of these uh, models is already published is based on on the family of models that that uh, Douglas uh, has um, ha has introduced into the literature and what we did that is to modify it in a semi-structural model uh, and to in in include like second round effects on inflation expectations that that paper is already out and the second one is trying to introduce um uh, weather shocks into a kind of fully microfounded model. And that is the, the idea that, that that we're going to follow today. But as I mentioned, it's preliminary. There's a lot of stuff that, that we're still working on, but I'm pretty sure, or I hope that is going to be interesting for you. Okay, let me share my, my screen. Let's get it started. Okay, so um, the title of our paper is Assessing Macroeconomic Impact of Weather Shocks in Colombia. Actually, this literature or the idea that that, that we're uh, proposing in this uh, uh, paper is not exactly related with uh, climate change related uh, shocks, but with some particular shocks that in countries like Colombia or Peru or Brazil have huge um, importance in in their in their business uh, cycle that is related with a uh, weather pattern that that occurs in the Pacific Ocean. Okay, so um, to introduce these kind of shocks, I'm going to tell you a little bit about ENSO, which is this fluctuation that probably many of you are aware that, that is uh, El Nino sudden oscillation. Um, we are going to show you like the main question and preliminary results. Then what we're going to do is to show you some econometric evidence, but this is just really stylized. It's just to show you what kind of supply shock um, we argue that, that ends of fluctuations uh, generate. And then we introduce this into a, a small open economy and education model with two sectors. And we try to do it as close as possible as um as the kind of structural models that are used in, in central banks in emerging markets. Okay, and then I'm going to show you some simulation of, of how the transmission of these shocks works through, through our um, simulated economy. Okay, so first of all, what are ENSO fluctuations? ENSO fluctuations or El Nino sudden oscillation fluctuation is uh, uh, a recurring climate uh, pattern that involves changes in temperature in, of waters and changes in oceanic or in, in air pressure in the oceanic um, in, in the Pacific Ocean. Okay, this is a natural recording event. It's something is is not something that is um, created by by weather, but climate change is a is a natural event. But the main concern regarding these kind of regular patterns is that given that we are in a changing environment, there's a lot of concern that human activities may uh, affect these, these weathers and they may become uh, stronger or more frequent, okay? 
Uh, there's a lot of debate in the climate science literature regarding this, but what we have seen in, at least during several of these episodes is that they are they have been really strong. The last strong episode that we have a hearing in, in Colombia was in 2016, and I'm going to focus on, on, on that period as, as well. Uh, and, and something that I also need to mention about this in the user oscillation is that it has impacts of, uh, in climate patterns all over the world, but particularly in Asia, in Australia, New Zealand, and, and South America, they have like really profound impacts, but they are heterogeneous. Just to give you an example, for, for example, in the case of Colombia, when we have El Nino, which is, I'm going to explain you a little bit more uh, what exactly that is, um, or, or how it's measured. Uh, we have like a, a strong um, drought um, and a dramatic uh, fall in, in rainfall. But for example, in Peru, they have the opposite effect. They have like excess of rains or something like that. So uh, El Nino and La Nina, which are these two, um, two episodes during the ends of fluctuations have heterogeneous effects across countries. In this picture, I just wanted to show you one of these measures that, that is used um, to, to account for, for ENSO, which is the, the temperature anomalies in the Pacific Ocean. This is a, a picture for the 2016, the, the large red tongue in Equatorial Pacific during, uh, during the highest period of, of excess uh, anomalies in, in the Pacific Ocean. And as you may see, um, like the, the increase in temperatures in the Pacific, uh, close to the, the, the Colombian Pacific coast, was was really was really strong. Okay, the measure that there are several measures that are used to to account for for these fluctuations. I'm just going to show you like a, a this is the most common is the the, the sea level uh, anomalies in in the Pacific Ocean, and when we have like these fluctuations, when we have like these episodes where the average of the temperature is above um, 0 0.5 is when we have a, a El Nino. So for example, here we have in, in 2000, let me show you here, what, what we have here is this a strong episode in 2016 related with, with El Nino. We also have had a, episodes of El Nino in, in in 2010, there was a really strong one in, in 1999, and so on and so forth. But so, something that I want to mention, for example, something that, that has happened is that these fluctuations, even for El Nino and La Nina, has become a, a stronger or, or, or some kind of an anomaly. This, this example, for example, this is La Nina, which in Colombia is an excess of rain. As you may see, like this La, La, La Nina effect was really long and really strong for, for a long period of time. And right now there's a lot of concerns because we're entering to a phase of El Nino and there's been a huge debate regarding how strong this El Nino episode is going to be. Okay, so these are the the, the, the anomalies in sea, in sea surface temperatures. Okay. Okay, let me erase this. Okay. So um, regarding the, the literature uh, review, there's a lot of literature regarding how these ends of fluctuations work. There are studies that have associated ENSO with lower economic growth rates and agricultural yields. Uh, there has been uh, studies regarding commodity prices, inflation, and even so uh, epidemic diseases and, and civil conflicts that are, are related with these uh, fluctuations. More broadly, over the last two years, what we have seen is a significant increase or interest in studying the macroeconomic impacts of weather shocks. And that is where this uh, paper uh, contributes to the literature, okay? In the case, for example, um, th this literature has used like several measures of, of weather shocks. One of these are um, excess temperatures, or a um, rainfall. What we're going to use here is this ends of fluctuations that as I mentioned, have 
uh, significant impacts in Colombia. In Colombia, we have also uh, an extensively documented the impact of, of ENSO fluctuations. There are two direct impacts. The first one is related with the production of perishable food inflation, uh, the perishable food products, because it increased the prices of these items. And this, there are several studies that, that have documented this. And also there's a, a, an additional impact on electricity prices because most of the um, electricity production in Colombia is, a, is with thermoelectrical production. So when we have like these shocks, a, we have to sub, make a substitution of, of our electrical um, network and that increases prices, okay? So so we have we already have a lot of, of econometric evidence on how these uh, chocks uh, affect prices, but uh, but is kind of, of limited to the effect of prices, okay? Uh, and pretty much these are econometric studies uh, for, for particular periods. Uh, regarding um, the introduction of these weather chocks into DSG models, there are uh, a recent literature that is trying to incorporate this into into a DSG framework. Uh, one interesting paper, and pretty much this is the one that we use or we base our research, is a uh, Gallic and uh, Vermandel. They make a study for for weather shocks in New Zealand, and that is pretty much the 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 base that we're using in our in our uh, model. Okay, so uh, in this is. Given that constant context in this study, what we're going to do is to study the macroeconomic implications of these ENSO shocks in Colombia. We're going to emphasize their, their effects on, on agricultural output, food prices, and headline inflation. First of all, we're going to use a, a Bayesian VR a model to, as, as I mentioned, like the, the only thing, we want these VRs for two reasons. The first one is just to, try to characterize what kind of supply shock it may look like, okay? It's, it's not very ambitious, it's just to, to try to get like one of these SLIs fact. And the second one is that when we are dealing with supply shocks, we're going to use something that is, not, but we're not going to use, we're going to use something that is called a damage function. And this damage function, even if you use the simplest one that you may imagine, estimate these parameters or calibrating is really difficult. There's a lot that we don't, we don't know yet about this. So one of the things that, that we're exploring is that using these VARs to try to pin down some of these parameters that you need in, in your damage function. Okay, so, um, and then using those SLS facts, we're going to try to introduce this into a two-sector DSG model uh, designed for a small open economy. Okay, this is this is the idea that we have here. So let me show you a, a little bit of the empirical part. This is a, a, a Bayesian VAR model that we're going to estimate. We made like several variations of these VARs uh, with less variables, with more variables, just trying to characterize this um, this uh, this kind of supply shocks. Okay, I'm just going to show you one of these. Uh, models that that we use we include uh, the, the external output gap external um ex external um food prices we also include investment consumption uh, the output gap the agricultural sector uh, agricultural sector gap and 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 food inflation okay it, it, it has a lot of variables but we're doing like a version of era and as i mentioned like the results are kind of robust if we reduce the number of, of, of variables. At least, for example, we, we, we don't take into account investment and consumption. And to see how these uh, answer chocks are going to affect the system. The, the advantage that we have here is that we can treat um, these anomalies in the Pacific Ocean as an exogenous variable. So we are going to introduce this in, in, as a, in the X um, vector. We are going to put the ends of fluctuations there. And for the rest of the identification of the VR system, we are uh, going to use a, a standard Koleski decomposition. That means that the most endogenous variable is going to be like a food inflation. Okay. 
in order to have like a, a stationary system, we detrended these variables with several methods, use it in linear, quadratic trends, a Hodrick and Prescott filters, but all, all the results seems to be um, robust for, for this estimation, okay? So um, as I mentioned, like we're, we're really modest about this, this, this part. It's just that we want to kind of characterize some of this evidence that as I mentioned, we have a lot. It's just to try to put it in a, in a multivariate system and to characterize this, um, this result. Uh, the data that we used to estimate this is from 2000 uh, up to 2019. We also, uh, if we extend the, the, the estimation period to include uh, the COVID period 2020, the results doesn't change that much. But when you include 2021 and 2022, you have to be a little bit careful because um, given the huge shocks that we have, uh, the, the huge inflationary shocks that we have, um, during the last years, like you, you have to be careful how to to control for other stuff that was going on. So we are going just to to show you the the result for this period. And as I mentioned, um, the idea here is just to get some SLIs facts. Um, to select the lag structure, we use a standard information criteria, and uh, we use uh, an independent normal wisher prior that assumes that the variance and covariance matrix is, is unknown. So pretty much the picture that I want to show you is this, it's, it's really simple. Uh, it, it's just what happens when we have these exogenous enzo chocks. And uh, as you may see, it seems that the overall uh, impact on, on, on GDP uh, or the output gap in this case is negligible. It's, there, there's no uh, impact on, on the overall GDP. But there's an impact on the agricultural sector. There's a, an important decrease on in the agricultural sector, and there's an important increase in inflation in, in food inflation. Okay, so what what I want to show you here is that pretty much we can characterize these enzo shocks as a nasty supply shock that has a, a, an important impact on the agricultural sector, but the impact on overall output at least for the data that we have yet, is not very strong. Um, that, that, that is the idea, okay? Uh, to characterize this, um, this weather shock. So in our VAR, we, we have evidence that points out that the nature of enzo shocks in Colombia can be linked to a supply cost push shock that we want to separate from other supply shocks that affects economies like Colombia. Um, we uh, find that food inflation and handle inflation in, in, other exercise, uh, in other exercises that I'm not exercises that I'm not showing here suggest substantial impact on consumer prices, both in food, uh, food inflation and handle inflation. And um, we found that the agricultural output uh, has some vulnera vulnerabilities to these kind of, of weather shocks. Okay. Despite all this, we don't find, uh, and this is something that we have seen in other in, in, in other literature, that there's some kind of specific effects on, on output, but on overall GDP, uh, the effect appears to be relatively no. So this is something that is interesting because we are going to try to put this into, into the model. One of the reasons why the impact on GDP is not that big it may be related with the chair of the of the agricultural sector. In the case of Colombia, it's not that small, but 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 it's not the biggest sector. It's around seven to eight percent of, of, of our overall GDP. But also something that that it may be happening that also um, mutes these uh, wear checks on overall GDP is that there's some changes in relative prices. That is something that we can capture in our in our two sectoral in our two sector model. So um, let me show you how we introduce this into, into our, into our uh, DSG model. What we're going to do is to have a two sector small open economy education model. We are going to have an agricultural sector and a non-agricultural sector. The agricultural sector factors in, in, in the impacts of, are impact, impacted by weather shocks. We're going to follow in this case Gallic and, uh, and Verbandel in the case that they use for, for New Zealand. And we're going to use 
this introducing or integrating a, a damage function in the agricultural sector production that I'm going to show you how that mechanism works. Uh, we have price rigidities. This is different from, from Gallic and, uh, and Vermandel. What we're going to use is introduce price rigidities in both the agricultural and the non-agricultural sector. Uh, the model is going to have intermediate firms, aggregate firms, and capital producers, uh, producers of, of, of each sector. And we are going to have a price rigidities with Calvo pricing. Why are we doing all this? Because we want a model that has monetary policy and we want a model that resembles the kind of models that that central banks in, 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 in Latin America has, like uh, El Patacón in Colombia or Samba in, in Brazil, that have these kind of, of features to, to make it as close as possible uh, as this kind of model. Then we are going to have a monetary policy role and we are going to have an imperfect pass-through that, uh, that is going to be influenced in imported goods for each sector and, and, and it's a feature of the model. So in this picture, we have um, what is going to happen or the sectors that we have. We have a, a non-agricultural sector, an agricultural sector. We have households. We have the central bank. We have the rest of the world and in, in the government that in our case is going to be like really simple. It's, we're not going to care that much for the government. It's just that we want for completeness we include a, a government in, in, in our model. And what, what is going to be interesting is what's going to happen with weather chocks. And when we have weather chocks, we are going to affect the agricultural sector. Pretty much what is going to happen here is that production of the agricultural sector is going to, to, to decline uh, given, uh, um, given this weather chock that is affecting production that is going to affect marginal production and increases increasing marginal uh, costs for the agricultural sector. That is going to push up a food inflation and that's going to have this impact on, on overall headline inflation, okay? The main features of, of the model is that we have, as I showed you in the previous picture, we have households, we have firms, and we're going to have agricultural and non-agricultural firms, a, a monetary authority, a really simplified fiscal authority, and an external sector. The households, we have a continuum of, of households normalized from zero to one uh, that consume, saves, and, and work in, in the two production sectors. This representative a household is going to, to use like, or we are going to use this a, a utility function, okay? And uh, where CT denotes consumption and HT is going to be the labor in agricultural and the non-agricultural uh, sector. And we're going to have an imperfect, in, in this production, in, in this con, um, utility function, we have to have some imperfect uh, sustainability uh, between these two sectors. The household budget constraint includes um, domestic bonds that pay a nominal return of R. Uh, we are going to have external bonds. Uh, SD is going to be the nominal exchange rate. TR taxes uh, from the government, um, PNCN, Epsilon NCN are the benefits that's coming from the non-agricultural sectors. These are the benefits that come from the agricultural sector. And we also have a risk premium cost paid in terms of domestic uh, uh, non-agricultural goods, okay? And those are the, the, the uses and, 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 and how the, the consumers spend this, okay? So pretty, pretty much is, is, this is really standard. What is going to be interesting here is what happened. The, the, the consumption problem is not that interesting. What is going to happen is what happens with the, the, the agricultural sector. So in the agricultural sector, what we're going to have is um, that we are going to have like these ENSO chocks. We're going to assume that they follow uh, an autoregressive one process. The difference here from Gallic and Vermandel is that they use for New Zealand um, humidity in 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 the in the soil. We are going to use here um, these ends of fluctuations, okay? And we're going to assume that they follow an an autoregressive one process. This a weather chalk um, epsilon w is going to be introduced into a damage function omega. Okay, and that damage function is going to affect the um, the production function 
for the agricultural sector. Pretty much what we're going to have here is that it's going to affect the productivity of land, okay? And by affecting the productivity of, of, of land, the marginal costs are going to go up and the prices uh, or, or food inflation is going to go up, okay? And how that um, damage function works, we're going to use a really uh, simplified uh, damage function, which is the same, the same damage function that is used by uh, Norhouse. This is the simplest kind of, of damage function. Here, when we actually use this damage function is when uh, things start getting a little bit complicated because um, there's a huge debate on how this damage function work. It's pretty much an, uh, an ad hoc assumption. In the climate science literature, there's a lot of critiques on, on, on how to introduce this. We don't know too much about the um, specific forms of this damage function. So there's a lot of research going on and a lot of debates. So we're going to use a simplified form. And in order, in our initial calibration, what we did is that we need to pin down this parameter, uh, theta, in this damage function. And it's not that easy. Like estimating this is, is, is kind of complicated. So what we're going to explore and pretty much what we did in this preliminary calibration that we're going to show you is that we use the VAR model to pin down this, this parameter and to get a sense uh, on, on how it may look. That means that this theta is reflecting something that is a, or something that has happened in the past. It doesn't say too much if this damage function uh, may change in the future. But even though uh, we have that this limitation, we know that this damage function is the way to introduce, for example, a mm, higher, eff bigger effects of these weather shocks on, on, on economic activity. So, so pretty much we know that part of the non-linearities that we may see in the future may arise for, from changes in this uh, parameter theta in, in this damage function, okay. In addition um, of having this uh, impact on the on the on the production function of the agricultural sector, the model allows the possibility that each farm has a time varying productivity through a lot of motion of land. So land may be a, the, the, this low motion uh, allows for having like more permanent effects or or having like like more persistence. In, in in how this weather shock may affect the productivity of, of land, okay? So it, it's something that is incorporated in the model if you want to create um, more persistent in, in, in how these um, weather shocks affect agricultural production. And the law of motion of physical capital in the agricultural sector is given by, by equation now, which is, which is pretty much a standard on how, on how um, investment uh, works for this sector. For the non-agricultural sector, we're going to have a, a simplified version. The firms are similar to agricultural firms. The, the only difference is that technology uh, uh, doesn't require land inputs to produce goods and are not directly affected by weather. So the production function is given by when the standard Cup Douglas a production fu function that depends on, on capital and, and labor. Okay. In addition to have monetary policy, which is something that is different from 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 the base model that I that I mentioned before, is that we incorporate capital pricing mechanisms. Uh, so only random selected fraction of firms are able to optimize their prices, and we introduce this price rigidity for for both sectors. In order to calibrate some of these parameters, we use the 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 parameters that. Uh, are uh, in the Patacon model. And we also use the same um, Taylor rule that is incorporated in, 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 in the central bank structural model. It's an, an a standard, uh, an a standard um, Taylor rule. The only thing is that we are going to solve this model. We're, we're not going to linearize the model. We are, we're going to have uh, the, the model in a nonlinear way when we introduce it into uh, Dynar. For the fiscal policy, as I mentioned, we want this for completeness to, to 
to, to, uh, to have the the um, the public sector but we are we have like this really simplified is just for for completeness and, and something that we want to develop a little bit further uh, introducing a more complicated fiscal policy but for the time being we just have a um, a really simplified a, a fiscal policy when where the public authority consumes some non-agricultural output G issue issues debt at the real interest and charges a loan some taxes. Okay, so it's pretty much a, a and, and the government budget constraint is also really simple. So we're not going to care too much uh, for the time being for this is just to to have the 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 whole economy um, in in our model. Also for the external sector, we have a, a set of equations for for uh, for the external uh, for the external sector. In this case, we follow Gallic and uh, uh, Vermandel. We have foreign households that make optimization decisions, um, given a, a budget constraint, and we have an exogenous foreign consumption that that follows equation sixteen. Okay, so pretty much is to have a, like a full a small open economy, uh, and that is why we have like the public sector and the external sector. But all the action in, in, in this uh, in these simulations are going to take place uh, with weather shocks. Okay. So let me go to the interesting part is the simulating Enzo shocks. First I want to mention a little bit of the calibration. Uh, most of these parameters we were able to take them from uh, El Patacón, which is our main a structural model. Some of some other uh, parameters were taken from from the literature, and and, and some other of the papers were taken from from Gallic and uh, uh, Vermandel. It, we right now we're working on on estimating most of these parameters, but as I mentioned before, uh, you can estimate estimate these parameters using Bayesian techniques. But the one that is a little bit more complicated is that theta that goes into the, into the damage function because it's not easy to, to have priors for these uh, parameters. So pretty much what we're doing is to using impulse res or the exercises that we're doing is to use impulse response matching to get some idea of, of how this parameter may look like. So uh, we have a, a preliminary calibration. That is what we are going to show you now for this result. But that was the strategy that, that we follow. So what we have here is that we're going to have an, an Enzo weather chalk. Uh, probably something that I didn't, that I didn't mention, like um, this uh, uh, weather chalks uh, are measured in, in, in Celsius degrees. So the, th these are going to be normalized to be like one degree Celsius shock, okay? And this shock is going to be transitory. So then we have um, this weather shock that we are going to uh, to see in, in our models that land costs are going to increase, land efficiency is going to go down. That means or what is happening here is that the marginal production of the agricultural sector is going down. That means that the agricultural output is going to go uh, is going to go down as well, and um, it's going to go down as well. This is what we have here, and what we're going to have that, that I'm not picturing here for some reason is that um, that uh, agricultural prices are going to go up. Okay, uh, but what I have here is that uh, here is that the relative uh, agricultural price. So also the agricultural the agricultural relative price is going to go up, okay? So what is going to happen with uh, the non-agricultural sector, the agriculture, given that uh, what is happening in the non-agricultural sector is that the non-agricultural relative prices is going down in, in a small, uh, what's relative, well, it's not that small, but, but we have like the, the, the non-agricultural relative price going down. That means that there is a stimulus for the non-agricultural sector so this is important because what we're going to have in here, given these changes in relative prices, is that um, these weather shocks, even though are going to affect overall inflation, there's also a change in relative prices 
that is a, that means that the agricultural output is going down and the non agricultural uh, non agricultural output is is going up in a small uh, amount but it still is partially compensating um, the effect on overall uh, GDP. So that is why uh, we see an, uh, an effect on output, but it's relatively, it should be relatively small, something that it will depend on, on, on the calibration, on, on how this agricultural output and, and non-agricultural output uh, behave, okay? So we also have that consumption in, in our economy is going down, the same thing with, with investment. And as a result of higher, a, a, a agricultural prices, we have the total inflation is going uh, up as well. And the monetary policy, given this increase in inflation is going to, is going to react, increasing the, the, the monetary policy rate. Even though when we have this uh, supply shock that in, in our simulation, it decreases um, in, in a small amount, the, the, the output, but given the increase in, in overall uh, inflation, that means that the monetary policy has to partially uh, react in this case. Okay. So um, pretty much we have really interesting stuff here. First, we kind of uh, find a way to introduce in this model uh, these changes in, in relative prices is not only the effect on, 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 on overall uh, head, on food inflation and overall headline inflation, but these changes in, 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 in relative prices, it depends on how um, this, the, the configuration of these shocks uh, has an impact on how total inflation and output is going to behave. And therefore uh, that uh, implies that depending on that, uh, the monetary policy is going to react react or not, okay? So th this is what we have in the simulation and, and, and that allowed us to, to understand a, a little bit more of, of these mechanisms that are, are, are in place here. So uh, the conclusions that we have uh, so far is that uh, we have developed a preliminary two sector TSG model that incorporates these ends of fluctuations directly into the model. Um, our goal has been to design a model that is as close as possible with models like El Patacon to try to uh, create like, for example, some reset scenarios or try to extract um, some chunks from, from uh, historical the, the composition. So that is why we try to, to build this model as close as, as, as possible to this, to this model. But still, there's a lot of things going on. This is a really a preliminary results. Um, uh, going forward, our immediate goal is to refine the model's calibration and estimation process. Uh, as I mentioned, what we have been working on is that in order to, to have this model or, or all, all the parameters of this model is that we need like a three-part approach. We need some parameters that need to be calibrated and that can came from, from El Patacon, most of these uh, parameters. There's some elasticities that we need to estimate using Bayesian uh, estimation and particularly for the, what is happening with the, with the damage function is that uh, we're using impulse response matching. There's a lot of critiques of using this technique. And the main critique is that we can characterize what happened in the past, but using this technique, there's not too much that we can say about this, uh, how this damage function is going to be in the future. But even though it will be like a first good, first approach um, to get some idea of this parameter and try to understand what happens, uh, for example, in different um, simulations when, when this parameter changes. Okay, and, and this uh, impulse response machine is, is instrumental for the calibration of this damage function. In the long run, uh, this model holds the potential to be uh, used for historical decomposition and for, for a, a scenario uh, building. And something that is important here is that, um, to know is that there's, there's a lot of research going on on trying to develop this model, but, but it's still there's a lot to do 
because in the literature you can have like the models that try to understand what happens like in the longer term for example uh, these models for carbon pricing or for um, energy transition okay and, and and there's also econometric models that have to that that study uh, how these shocks affect uh, particular sectors in particular areas of the economy and so on and so forth but what we're trying to do is trying to uh, put it in in a in, in a medium term framework to uh, for to create like alternative uh, tools that allows central banks uh, in particularly in countries uh, like Colombia that we have like these uh, nasty supply shocks related with them so uh, to build a scenarios and to and to learn a little bit more on, on the macroeconomic uh, implication of this and the final uh, things that we we have to mention is that this model does not explore non-linearities um, which uh, present that presents an area for potential exploration in the future research but something that we have learned in doing these models that, that i want to mention here is that there's a lot of econometric evidence on, on some kind of non-linearities but the problem is that we don't know too much about those linearities pretty much the result is that when we have a really really strong uh, enzo chocks the impacts on food inflation for example or headline inflation is going to be higher than for regular el nino episodes okay but in in our uh, previous research in this research we have a, at least a clue or for, from where these non-linearities may came from in our case the non-linearity may came from from um, this parameter theta that it, that it may change depending on the intensity of the of the answer chalk and also it came in something that we have in in, in our working paper for this uh, for this uh, presentation that i've just showed you that is related on, on how persistent the effect may be on on the law of motion of land so even though we are not in the nonlinear world we may have some ideas or from where these non-linearities in some cases uh, may be. Uh, and in the previous paper, that is not the one that I'm showing you here, but, but but it's really interesting because it's related with with the literature that um, that Doc has developed over several years, uh, is related with uh, central bank credibility. In that paper that, that, uh, that as I mentioned, and I invite you to read it, if you're interested in these topics, we have a endogenous um, a monetary policy credibility, and it depends on the state of that credibility of the central bank. If this nasty supply shock is going to be a higher effect or not when when it materializes. So even though we're not in in in, in this nonlinear world with these kind of models, at least we're grasping some or we're getting. Uh, some ideas or from where these nonlinearities uh, may come from. So pretty much this is that I have uh, for you today.